Today is Earth Day. Every year on April 22nd, people come together to show support for environmental protection. It's a reminder to dedicate our time, resources, and energy to solving climate change and other environmental issues. For the next 20 minutes, we're gonna talk about the impacts right here on Georgia and how you can reduce your carbon footprint. Earth Day was first held in 1970 and now includes a wide range of events coordinated globally in more than 193 countries. The official theme for 2023 is invest in our planet. This year, advocates setting six goals for people who want to go green. They include implementing climate literacy in schools, ending single use plastics, planting trees, voting for policy that protects our environment, cleaning up communities and wearing sustainable fashion. I try to do so myself. That's why we're helping you become a little greener this Earth Day. Now you probably encounter the three arrow recycling symbol countless times a day, but it turns out it doesn't always mean you should toss that item into the recycle bin. Abby Larico from our Verify team explains why. Let's verify. Does the chasing arrow symbol mean something is recyclable? Our sources are Sarah Dearman with the Recycling Partnership, the Montgomery County, Maryland Division of Solid Waste Services, the Federal Trade Commission, and the EPA. The FTC has guidelines on how to market recyclable materials, but it's on the manufacturer to follow them, and it doesn't regulate the use of the three arrow symbol. In fact, some versions of the chasing arrow are only meant to show the item is made in part with recycled materials, not that it's still recyclable. Aluminum cans, glass bottles, clean unlaminated paper. The EPA says those are all typically a safe bet for the single stream recycling bins you'll find around town. But plastic makes for a trickier toss. The arrow symbol surrounds a number called the resin identification number. Well, that's actually just telling you what the material is. It's telling us what type of plastic it is not necessarily that it's recyclable. You may already know different areas and waste management systems are equipped to recycle different types of plastics, but that also means you'll find the symbol on materials that are not widely recyclable. For example, many foam containers are type six, which is typically not accepted at recycling facilities. Type four can be recyclable, but if it's used in a plastic bag, wrap or bubble mailer, you'll probably have to find a special collection bin. It can go be recycled, but if it goes into your curbside recycling cart, then it can actually mess up their equipment. Items may also be made up of different types of plastics, some recyclable, some not. This package, you actually need to take this pump off before you put it in the recycling bin. So we can verify, no, the chasing arrow symbol does not mean an item is recyclable. You might have to think before you toss, but when you do, you're minding the planet. People want to recycle, but we do have to make this information more easily available and make sure that it's not too confusing. All right, this Earth Day, you can get in on the action by recycling your most unconventional household items, bringing them to the Center for Hard to Recycle Material in Atlanta, also known as CHARM. CHARM will take everything from styrofoam to used bicycles and electronics and even cigarette butts and to be recycled or processed and given new life. All you need is an appointment. CHARM's mission is to create a community that cares about a healthy and sustainable environment. To educate people that everything in your home possibly has another life or someone else could use it before you just throw it away. Be sure to go to Charm's website to make an appointment and see all the things the facility will accept. Here's another opportunity for you to recycle. Today, 11 Alive is co-sponsoring an electronic recycling event. Now collect all your old electronics and join us at Lenox Square Mall between 9 a.m. and 2 p.m. Everyone who recycles with us will be entered to win a $500 Simons gift card. Again, that's today from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. We'll see you there. The USDA says Americans waste billions of dollars in food every year. Now federal agencies are trying to end waste throughout every step of the food making process. Our Jennifer Bellamy explains how you can make a difference in your own home and reduce your carbon footprint. Thousands of tons of food wasted every day in the U.S. Food meant for our tables ending up in the trash. But a partnership among several federal agencies and groups hopes to reverse that and instead increase the amount of safe, nutritious food donated to those in need and keep any waste that's unavoidable out of landfills. That means education and outreach efforts for food manufacturers, retail, restaurant and food service industries aimed at preventing, recovering and recycling extra food. The ultimate goal set back in September 2015 is to cut food waste in half by 2030. 
Right now in the United States, more than a third of all available food goes uneaten through loss or waste, with more than 75 billion pounds of food trashed each year, according to the government. In fact, the FDA says it's the single largest type of waste in our daily trash. And when food is tossed out, so are opportunities for economic growth, healthier communities, and environmental protection. So why are we wasting so much food? The USDA says it happens in every part of the process to get a meal to your table. During production, food can spoil or be exposed to insects, rodents, mold, and bacteria. And during the retail stage, waste can come from equipment malfunctions, like a broken refrigerator, over-ordering, and tossing out blemished produce. And we as consumers contribute too. SaveTheFood.com says a family of four loses at least $1,500 a year on wasted food. That's by buying or cooking too much and throwing out what's left, getting rid of food too soon by misreading best before labels, or just storing food improperly. So to avoid waste, the USDA suggests following the food recovery hierarchy. The inverted pyramid outlines best practices from not creating wasted food in the first place to what to do if it's unavoidable through donations to people than animals. Finding industrial uses for items like fat, oil and grease to power devices and composting to feed and nourish the soil with your local landfill as a last resort. Mercedes-Benz Stadium is also getting in on Earth Day celebrations. Last week, the stadium's sustainability team gave us a tour to show us a behind-the-scenes look at their journey toward achieving zero waste. One of the cool things that the stadium may have in place is a water reclamation system. Now, it helps catch rainwater to be reused on site. The stadium also has solar panels and compost sites and encourages fans to recycle cans and bottles while at the stadium, and they compost everything else. It's a lifestyle for us to operate this way, and, and we won't stop operating that way anytime soon. The 75,000 venue, seat venue is able to keep 90% of the trash out of landfills. As we honor Earth Day, climate change is at the top of minds of many of us, including how it impacts us right here in Georgia. 63% of Georgia voters didn't think enough was being done to address climate change. That's according to the latest data by the University of Georgia. As climate scientist Dr. Kim Cobb explains, small things can lead to big changes. People who are concerned about climate and waking up to climate already coming into this impression that it's too late. <laughs> it's already done and it's just an overwhelming problem that we can't solve. And that is so far from the truth. Dr. Cobb suggests a few everyday things you can do to help the environment. Reduce the amount of meat and animal products you consume. Use mass transit more and turn off your appliances when you're not using them. Dr. Cobb says it's never too late to start giving back. When we talk about climate change and more extreme weather events, there's not a one size fits all correlation between the two. Yes, our number of billion dollar weather and climate disasters has been increasing in recent decades. But when we look at the science of a warmer climate, different types of extreme weather can be connected to climate change more than others. Now, this next graph really spells it out. It shows how confident scientists are about human driven changes to certain types of weather events. Now, at the top of this graph, meaning we can find the most connection between the two is extreme cold events and extreme heat. As we go down the line a little bit, there is some correlation between drought and extreme rainfall events with a warmer climate as we have more anthropogenic warming. Let's break down some of these extremes for Atlanta. Relatively small increases in our average global temperature can cause a much larger increase in daily heat extremes. In Atlanta, we've seen a trend of much more record warm temperatures set than record cold in recent decades. This graph on Climate Central shows just that. Most of our record temperatures since the start of the 1980s have been record highs, not lows. Record lows are becoming more rare. Our warming climate is part of the cause behind this. There's also some influence from Atlanta's constantly growing concrete jungle and the heat island effect. Climate change is also bringing heavier rain extremes and flood risk to Atlanta. For every one degree Fahrenheit of warming, the air can hold an extra 4% of moisture. Our wettest days are becoming wetter. From 1970 to 2021, Atlanta saw a 9.5% increase in its hourly rain rates. Heavier downpours create a higher risk of flash flooding on days with extreme rainfall. 
Although we cannot contribute one extreme rainfall event or single high heat day alone to climate change, we can make the connection that their frequency is being influenced by the anthropogenic warming of our planet. Meteorologist Melissa Nord, 11 Alive News. Climate change can be a confusing and overwhelming topic, especially for kids. So experts are sharing some tips for talking to your children all about it. First, they say, hear them out. Make time for them to share how they feel. Don't underestimate the ability for them to ask tough questions or even teach you a thing or two. Next, rely on science. Having a responsible conversation about the climate crisis means making sure that they are informed by the scientists and climate researchers who know best. And third, take action together. Inspire children to see themselves as agents of change. Commit to implementing climate-friendly ways of living on your daily routine. And trying out plant-based recipes or cycling to work or school, that always helps as well. President Joe Biden is pushing Americans to use greener forms of energy, and he isn't the first president to do so. Brandon Lewis from our Verified team looks into viral claims that former President Jimmy Carter installed solar panels during his time in office. President Jimmy Carter was the first president to acknowledge climate change while in office. A viral Reddit post with 123,000 upvotes claims Carter tried to address the energy crisis by adding solar panels to the White House during his administration, only to have his successor, Ronald Reagan, remove them. So let's verify. Did President Jimmy Carter have solar panels installed on the White House that President Ronald Reagan later removed? Our sources are the National Museum of American History, the White House Historical Association, Unity College, the University of California, and the U.S. Department of Energy. In 1979, gas prices were spiking across the nation, and Americans were looking for alternatives. The White House Historical Association says Carter decided to set the example and installed 32 solar panels on the roof of the West Wing to heat water in the White House. At the time, he predicted the panels would still be in use in the year 2000. In reality, the panels were removed in 1986 under then-President Reagan when the White House roof was resurfaced, and they never went back. The panels were placed into storage. So, yes, President Jimmy Carter did have solar panels installed on the White House that President Ronald Reagan later removed. Those panels did get a second life. In 1991, 16 of them were moved to Unity College in Maine, where they powered a water heater in the school's cafeteria until 2010. As for the White House, President George W. Bush installed solar panels on a maintenance building in 2003. Ten years later, President Barack Obama added panels to the main building. With your Verify, I'm Brandon Lewis. A warmer climate can mean rising sea levels and more significant flooding along our coast when it comes to events like hurricanes. That's why scientists and engineers with Georgia Tech are installing a network of sea level sensors along Georgia's coast. They are meant to help with emergency planning and response during weather events. Meteorologist Melissa Lord spoke with one of the scientists behind the project. Georgia's coastline, 110 miles featuring some of the most diverse ecosystems on the planet. It includes one-third of the remaining salt marshes in the eastern U.S. and the largest estuary system on the Atlantic coast. It's also becoming increasingly more vulnerable to flooding events as our climate warms. Storm surge and hurricanes, nuisance coastal flood events, and heavy rain-induced flash floods will become a greater risk. These extremes have morphed and changed our coast and put populations near Savannah at risk. Dr. Russell Clark with Georgia Tech has been spearheading the Smart Sea Level Sensors project along our coastline to gather more precise measurements of how our floods are changing over time. They all have stories. They come to us when we're installing about stories about uh, we think it's flooding more, uh, but we're not sure why, and we can help them understand that and, and really share that with others uh, about what's really happening. First deployed in 2018, these smart sea level sensors were designed for Chatham County Emergency Management so they could better respond to flood events. Challenged us with the, the, the goal of, can you tell me when rising water has, has touched a bridge, gotten high enough that it might actually compromise the structure? because we need to send an inspector out. The sensor costs just under $500 and measures the distance between the bridge or dock to the waterway below it every five minutes, then transmits it by radio waves. In real time, they can see how each weather event impacts different parts of the community. With each storm event, 
it, it, there's really a different, different kind of impact around the community. Uh, some places flood all the time, but many places only flood depending on which way the wind is blowing or how much rain there was or where we are in the tide cycle. And so getting that, that local visibility into how different storms flood in different areas, that's what part of what this project is, allows us to do. And the community is helping to make this research possible. Dr. Clark and his team designed the sensors, but it's a group of high school engineering students in Savannah that now builds and tests each new sensor. They're working towards the goal of 100 total sensors in the Savannah area, after which they'll move further down the coastline and along inland waterways. This project is about uh, providing uh, data about what's going on in our uh, communities with regards to flooding uh, and, and changing climate and the impacts uh, on uh, our daily lives. Michael, Irma, Florence, Ian, hurricanes that could have been much worse for Georgia's coastline if their paths or speeds change slightly. Tides are the pulsing heart of our coastline. And if any of the peak surge with these storms had come at high tide, water levels could have been nearly eight feet more. These smart sea level sensors will be the stethoscope to weather our most testing weather extremes ahead. Meteorologist Melissa Nord, 11 Alive News. All right, thanks a lot, Melissa. A groundbreaking project at UGA could save honeybees and help food supplies worldwide. Our Doug Richards traveled to Athens to see it for himself. To researchers here at the University of Georgia, it's no stretch to say that saving the honeybee is tantamount to saving the world. We know what's killing bees. UGA entomologist yeah, yeah. Keith Delaplane is among the beekeepers who have fretted for years over declining and, uh, honeybee population. The, the problems that are facing honeybees are pretty much universal. Commercial pesticides, climate change, and a nasty disease called American fowl brood, which is a worldwide killer of honeybees. And it is historically the worst honeybee disease of all. Honeybees are pollinators. Their decline threatens plants, which threatens the food supply. But we're also losing plants. And when we're losing plants, we're losing the planet. And it becomes uninhabitable. And all starts with the honeybee. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a critical component and for, for our survival. Annette Kleiser's company, Dalen Animal Health, has developed a vaccine for the disease. UGA has tested it, giving the vaccine orally to countless queen bees, which have passed on the immunity to the rest of their hives. Delaplane says it is a landmark breakthrough for honeybees. So by vaccinating one insect, you get the whole hive vaccinated. It is not just a new tool, it's a new category of tool. It's a huge deal. It's saving the world. Kleiser says her company will start shipping vaccines to beekeepers in North America this spring. Saving the world. <laughs> not bad. One bee at a time. In Athens, Doug Richards, <laughs> 11 Alive News. Well, Atlanta is working to become a little greener, literally. The city plans to add 8,000 more trees to the downtown area over the next five years. Now, this is a part of an update to Atlanta's tree protection ordinance. Adding trees can help bring down the air temperature in cities, provide cleaner air, and lower environmental damage created by higher air conditioner use. If you want to get outdoors this weekend, there's no view of Atlanta like the one on top of Stone Mountain. You can see the city, you can see the sky, and for one Atlanta man, limitless possibilities. Caitlin Ross shares how his journey up the mountain changed his life. The shape of Stone Mountain gets Zach Cross every time. It's just such a gem in terms of the beauty, like the wildlife here, the flowers. But he had to grow to love the rocks and roots that make up its face. The first few times I started to come up the mountain, I definitely didn't see the beauty of the park at that point. I was really just struggling up the mountain. I was just having a really hard time. It's about one mile, and I think it took me about 75 to 80 minutes. Three years later, he makes the climb in under 20 minutes. The lost time, a testament to what he lost on the mountain. Losing weight has been, uh, this has been a huge part of the journey for sure. Just pouring a lot of blood, sweat and tears onto this mountain. His first turn on the trail, a turning point in his life. 
in March of 2020, I was about 400 pounds, maybe 380. He set out to climb Stone Mountain for the first time in May of 2020 and has hiked its trails nearly every day since. It's going to suck for the first few months. It absolutely sucked and it's it's not easy. But there is like a there's a there's a, a light on the horizon. Those trails led Zach out of a deep depression. Flowers are blooming. It's getting really, really beautiful. Those steps shedding 200 pounds. And get pretty dicey at the top there. It's pretty much straight up, really steep, but that's the best part of the workout. You kind of lay it all on the line there at the end. On the top of Stone Mountain, he decided to lay it on the line again. The Appalachian Trail is the granddaddy of all trails. Losing 200 pounds gave Zach the confidence to take on the Appalachian Trail, 2,200 miles. The mental aspect of five months on the trail, living in a tent in the freezing rain, cold, that's gonna be what's really tough. Overcoming everything the trail throws at him alone. Oh, I'm slipped. He'll cover the ground with a 35 pound pack and a few extra pairs of shoes. About five, five or six pairs of shoes, if I had to guess. Wearing a new tread on the trail and himself. I don't think that I'll be the same person that I am today. I think I will, I think my life will change. A new silhouette carved from the face of the mountain that changed him. It's really shaped me in such a weird way that a, a mountain shouldn't be able to shape someone. It's, it's really made me who I am today and I'm the happiest I've ever been. How inspiring. He will set out on May 1st, three years to the day he decided to change his life. He plans to finish up by October. Thank you for joining us for this Earth Day special. You can find more information about how to go green on our website at 11live.com.